So today we're going to talk about um, social insurance. Uh, so why do we have this thing called social insurance? Well, let's first talk about what social insurance is and then ask why we have it. OK? So basically, social insurance is government provided insurance programs. This is the largest single category of government expenditure in the US today, is government provided insurance programs. Now, why do we have these? Well, you might say, well, we know why I have these. We learned about uncertainty. We already talked about how people dislike uncertainty and about how, as a result, insurance is big business in America. Private insurance for health, for auto, for life, for property and casualty adds up to about $1.5 trillion every year. OK? Um, so we already have big business of private insurance. So why does the government need to get involved? I mean, after all, people want insurance if they're risk averse. We talked about insurance markets can work. Uh, and as always in economics, the question is, what's wrong with the private market? What is the market failure that might generate interest in government get, being involved? And the market failure in the context of insurance is a different kind of market failure we've talked about. We've talked about market failures like imperfect competition as a market failure. We talk about externalities as a market failure. The new kind of market failure we want to talk about today is what we call information asymmetry. Information asymmetry. OK? Um, basically, which is the difference in the information available to sellers and to buyers in a given market. So far in this course, we sort of assumed full information. We've assumed everybody knows everything. We weaken that assumption a little bit with uncertainty and say that no, people don't know whether they're going to be sick or healthy, but they still knew the probabilities. Now we're going to weaken it further by saying, in not only information imperfect, but different parties in a transaction might have different levels of information. And that's going to turn out to cause um, market failure. That information asymmetry will cause market failure. Now the math here is quite hard, harder than we do in this class. So we'll just sort of do this by an example or two. And the best example to start with is the so-called lemons problem that was laid out by the Nobel Prize winning economist George Akerlof in 1970. Nobel Prize winning economist and uh, husband of former Fed chairman Janet Yellen, quite a power couple. Um, and um, here's what Akerlof laid out. He said, let's look at the market for used cars. And this is the market for used cars as of 1970. There was no car fax. There was none of this information. Okay, in 1970, when to buy a used car, you just sort of went and kicked the tires and decided if you were going to buy it. Okay? So this is a classic case of an information asymmetry in that someone selling a car knows what's wrong with it, whereas the person buying the car doesn't. Okay, I'll go think we sort of kick the tires and hope for the best. Okay, we don't. So basically, um, and in particular, sellers of cars might be selling them because they're not good. After all, why sell a car? Maybe because it's what's called a lemon. A lemon is something which is a poorly performing product. In this case, a car that's got something wrong with it. So when you go to buy a car, you're worried. You want to buy a car in the used car market, but you're worried, why is someone selling this car? You should be. Why is someone selling this car? If it's really in good shape, why would they be selling it? Therefore, as a result, Akerlof argued, there might be a collapse of the entire used car market. There might not be transactions that happen that can make both parties better off. Remember, a market failure is whenever the private market fails to maximize welfare. What that means is a market failure arises whenever the private market does not deliver all transactions that make buyer and seller better off. Okay? And here, and so let's look at an example of this. Suppose that I have a 10-year-old car and I keep it in pristine shape. Hint, that's not true for me. I'm terrible at cars. But imagine I was someone who wasn't. Uh, I kept my 10-year-old car in pristine shape. And let's say that a 10-year-old car in pristine shape uh, is, um, and let's say I'm trying to sell this car. And let's say that 
I would happily take $5,000 for this 10-year-old car that's in pristine shape. So I would be willing to sell at 5K. And let's say that you, let's say Patricia, needs that used car. And she is willing to buy a car that's in good shape for 6K. So my willingness to, willingness to provide, willingness to supply, is 5K. Her willingness to pay is 6K. So that is a transaction that should happen. Given the quality of my car, given that it's in good shape, she is willing to pay $1,000 more than I'm willing to sell it for. So a transaction should happen, and it'll be welfare maximizing. But let's say that most 10-year-old cars are not in good shape. Most 10-year-old cars, in fact, are in kind of crappy shape. And in fact, the, for the typical 10-year-old car, to get it up and running well, you'd have to throw $2,000 in once you bought it. And Patricia knows this. She knows that for the typical 10-year-old car, she would have to put $2,000 in. So her willingness to pay is not 6 k it's 4 k for an average 10-year-old car. Now, I say to Patricia, well, that's an average 10-year-old car, but I have a perfect 10-year-old car. You don't need to put 2 k into it. It's good to go. So why don't we split the difference? We'll pay 55 k And she says, no way. You're a damn liar. I have no way of knowing your car is better than average. All I know is the average 10-year-old car needs $2,000 of work, so I'm not going to pay more than $4,000 for your car. As a result, Patricia doesn't buy my car. And a transaction that would have made both parties better off does not happen. A transaction where if there was full information, like we have much more of today, where you can get the entire record of the car, all the crash it's been, and how much care it's taken care of, that problem would go away, should go away. Because now Patricia could look at my Carfax and note this, is, this in fact, is a pristine car, and she's more willing to pay the 6000 for it. But the bottom line is, in this world of 1970, this was a market failure because a transaction that made both parties better off did not happen because of imperfect information. Okay? The buyer was perfectly happy to buy, Patricia was perfectly happy to buy my car, but because I had information that she didn't, and she was just suspicious that I was lying, as a result, that transaction didn't happen. Now, questions about that? Do people understand it's a market failure? OK, now we come to insurance. The story is flipped. Now it's not the seller that has the information. It's the buyer that has the information. In particular, when you buy insurance, you know how healthy you are. You know your genetic history. You know whether you're a risk taker. You know whether you're around a lot of snotty kids who might get you sick. You know a lot of stuff about yourself that the insurer doesn't know. As a result, the information asymmetry is flipped. With insurance, the insurer is worried that when you come looking for insurance, they're worried looking for insurance because you're sick. Now, you might be looking for insurance because you're risk averse, and that's great for insurers. We talked about insurance, how there's essentially a gain. I'm willing to pay a risk premium so insurers can make money by selling to me. But what if I'm not coming because I'm risk averse? What if I'm coming because I'm a huge skydiving fan? OK, and you don't know that. You might be afraid to sell me insurance because you might lose money on me. OK? So let's work out another example to show this. Imagine you graduate and you decide a great business model is to offer health insurance to recent MIT grads. You say, look, we're a bunch of kind of careful nerds. We're like not going to go skydiving. We're like just going to sit at our desks and work. Uh, maybe there'll be carpal tunnel risk. But other than that, we're a pretty safe bunch. So I'm going to offer health insurance to recent MIT grads because they're a healthy group. And let's say, um, suppose that of every 100 MIT grads, 90 are healthy and 10 are sickly. Let's just suppose you know those facts. You know those facts. You've collected the data to know that on average, of every 100 grads, 90 are healthy, 10 are sickly. You don't know which are which, but you know the proportions. And let's say that with a healthy person, over the next year, there's a 10% chance that they will need, um, that they will encourage, that they will incur a $10,000 charge. And a 90% chance that they, 90% chance that they'll have zero costs. 
okay, so there's a 10% chance of a $10,000 cost, 90% chance of a zero cost, okay? So your expected cost for insuring this person is $1,000. You expect someone like that will cost you uh, uh, $1,000. Now suppose for the sickly guy, there's a 50% chance 50% chance that they'll cost you 10K, and a 50% chance that they'll cost you zero. So your expected cost for them, uh, the expected cost for this person is $5,000. Okay? Do people understand the setup? There's two types. I know these facts, but I don't know who's who. I just know these facts, okay, because I'm good at math. I've done all the actuarial calculations. OK? Now, if everyone buys, and now I'm going to set my price. Well, I'm going to do the price. I'm going to say, look, if everyone buys health insurance, then I've got my expected cost is 0 0.9 times 1,000 plus 0 0.1 times 5,000. My expected cost is 1,400. So I expect to have to spend 1,400 a year. In fact. On average, I'll spend 1400 a year. Okay, with large enough samples, I can predict that with certainty. That if everyone buys insurance, I'll spend $1,400 a year. So let's say you're risk neutral because you're rich, and so 1400 you know, this is sort of risk, risk neutral for you. So you say, look, I'll just charge, I'll set a premium of 1500 And I'll make $100 per person. If 100 people buy, that's $10,000 profit. That's pretty good. Okay, there are 1,000 kids in a graduating class. If 1,000 kids buy and I make $100 profit, that's 100000 That's pretty good money for a year. OK? Now, what is wrong with this calculation? What, in fact, will happen if you sell insurance for $1,500? Yeah? Well, let's go step by step. What about sick people? If you sell $1,500, what will they do? Yes. Yeah, so if you set up $1,500, you are certainly going to sell to all the sick. OK. So if you sell for $1,500, you'll certainly sell to all the sick. What about the healthy? What will determine whether or not they buy? Yeah. Not quite. Not quite. There's another piece, too. Don't forget. What else? What else? What else? It's not just the expected cost. What else? Uh, the risk aversion. Remember, there's a risk premium that they'll pay. So it's, whether that healthy person will buy or not, if it's just expected cost, then they wouldn't buy. It's $1,000 expected cost. Why the $1,500? But some might be risk averse and buy. So let's say, let's just say half the guys are risk averse and they, they're willing to pay $1,500 for a $1,000 expected cost and half aren't. So let's say you end up selling to all the sick and half the healthy. Okay? So how much money do you make? Well, you make. You sell to 60 people at $1,500 each. So your revenues are $75,000, right? You sell to 50 healthy and 10 sick, $75,000 of revenues. What are your costs? Your costs are you have 10 people that are going to cost you 5,000. So it's 50,000 plus 50 people that are going to cost you 1,000 plus another 50,000 equals $100,000, and you've lost money. You priced at above the expected total and lost money. Why did you lose money? You lost money because of the problem of adverse selection. The problem of what we call adverse selection. Adverse selection is the problem that, due to information asymmetries, only the worst risks will participate in the market. And that will cause people selling in the market to lose money. Or likewise here, the concern is that only the, only the worst cars will participate in the market. And so the people who buy cars will be worse off. Yeah? Wouldn't you make 90000 Wouldn't you make? No, you sell to, you sell 1500 each, and you sell to, uh, yes, you're right. You make ninety thousand. My bad. Yes, fifteen hundred each times sixty people is ninety thousand. You still lose money, but not as much. Right. 
OK? Now, there's a, now, you might say, look, you're not losing that much. Easy solution, just raise the price. Right? What if you said, fine, let's just raise the price and let's charge $2,000 a person? Then that would cover, right? Because $2,000 a person, six people would make $120,000. The costs are $100,000. You'd be golden, right? Yeah. Who would you lose? Healthy. Not the sick. The sick are delighted to buy 10000 But once you raise the price, more healthy people drop out because it, it's higher than their risk premium. So what happens is by raising the price, you don't necessarily make money. It depends on how many healthy people drop out. So for example, imagine that um, you um, raise it to $2,000, but now the number of healthy people that buys drops to 20 from 50. Then you lose money again. So the point is, you can't necessarily solve this problem just by raising the price because there's this what we call death spiral. This is a term we call a death spiral, which is as you raise the price, you chase out the healthier people, which means you have to raise the price more, which chases out even healthier, even more healthy people, and you end up in this death spiral. Okay. So that is the problem of that is the problem of adverse selection, and that leads you to say, you know what? I'm not going to offer this product. I can't make money on it. Because what, if I set the price, um, whatever price I set, I'm going to lose money. So I'm not going to offer the product. Therefore, the market has failed. A market that might have existed, on average, this was a market that made people better off. But the market that might have existed doesn't, doesn't exist. Yeah? The death spiral, what is it like compared to like something that's equivalent to the equilibrium price market for example, It's near like thousand because all the sick people will still will not stop out because they're assuming everyone is different. Right? right. So if you leave this alone, that's an excellent point. What, sh what should the new equilibrium be? The price barrel should continue until you've chased all the healthy people out. And then you price, but you'd have to price it then at what? 5,000 plus something. So as long as sickly people are risk averse, you could still make money. You could still make money if you sold, say, 5,500 with even modest risk aversion. Why is that still a market failure? Well, because there's, there's all these healthy people who now can't get health insurance. OK? So yes, it doesn't mean the market collapses. Market failure doesn't necessarily mean market collapse. It means a reduction in welfare because transactions that might make some people better off aren't happening. Here, you might be able to offer insurance for healthy people that makes them better off, but you're not. You're only offering insurance for the sick. So that's a market failure, because healthy people who might want the insurance end up being kept out of the market by ever selection. OK? Questions about that? And that is the fundamental market failure we face in insurance markets. That's why we think private insurance markets will not function well, because private insurers, in some sense, the fundamental problem is that you're setting one price, uh, one price for multiple products. The great case of adverse selection is going to buy fruit at the beginning versus the end of the day. What's the difference? Buy fruit at the beginning and the end of the day. You guys probably don't buy a lot of fruit, but try to think about it. Yeah. Probably better selection at the beginning of the day. You can and, and at the end of the day, in particular, what's left? Kind of the noise noise. All the shitty fruit is left. Because you looked at one price, you didn't say good apples a dollar and eighty, shitty apples a dollar forty. You said apples one seventy. So people come and they buy apples. They they go and they feel it, you know, and they feel around. They find the good ones. The ones that left are crap. Okay, and that is the adverse selection problem. Now with apples, the market still exists. Why? Because they charge so much, they can live with a few bad apples being at the bottom, so to speak. A few bad apples being at the bottom. But with health insurance. If I get one bad risk, someone, say, who's really, really sick and costs a million dollars, I go out of business. So adverse selection may not destroy markets. That doesn't destroy the Apple market. But it can destroy or significantly impede insurance markets. OK? Questions about that? Yeah, Manny. Is this why like, insurance companies typically like, ha like hassle uh, hospitals, like lower the prices, or they give them better discounts so they can like, increase? The price for people. Well, that's a separate issue. We'll talk about that next lecture. We talk about healthcare. So that's a separate issue about the cost of healthcare. This is a reason why insurance companies make you fill a lot of forms before you go in. So it's for this reason, insurance companies are not powerless against this problem. 
they could try to collect as much information about you as they can. As I look, get more and more information, can learn more and more who's healthy and who's sick, then I can solve this problem. Um, so you're familiar with like those, those uh, like home kits that are you Yeah. And like 23 and people send you. Yeah, 23 and me, yeah. yeah. So um, is it possible that like at some point in the foreseeable future, those are going to become like part of, like as that becomes cheap enough, those are going to become part of how insurance is determined and like if you are, like if, you, if it's in your DNA to get like some condition when you get old, but we can say you have a pre-existing condition now, but like so this is a great point. I'll talk this more next time. I'll talk about it now, which is, in some sense, we are eventually moving to a point where there'll be no adverse selection. Now, you might say, on the one hand, that's because ultimately we'll know everything about you from the moment you're born. right? We'll know your genes. We'll know what's going Now, we won't know if you're a skydiver, but we'll, know, we'll probably know genes that determine risk taking, and we'll charge more for, for people who like taking risks. So the, now, the good news is that then I can, I can make the market work. The bad news is in that world, how would I set my insurance? I would price this, I would charge, because what I would do is I'd say, your genes say you're healthy, so I want 1,100 bucks from you. Your genes say you're sick, so I want $6,000 from you. So essentially, insurance wouldn't exist anymore. There'd be no insurance. What is insurance? Insurance is pooling people with different probabilities of adverse events, and letting us all benefit from the fact that if it happens to us, at least we're protected. Well, if you charge me my expected cost, I'm no longer protected. So here's the example that makes this perfectly clear, one of the most famous examples. Ken Arrows, one of the great economists of the 20th century, died recently. He had his famous islands example. Ken Arrows' islands example is the following. Imagine there's two islands somewhere in the South Pacific that are very small, that's got one farmer on each. And the farmers know a hurricane is coming and it's going to wipe out one of their islands, but they don't know which. There's no one's going to get wiped out. What will they naturally do? They'll naturally get together and say, look, I know it's going to get wiped out, but let's insure each other. If I get wiped out, you give me a bunch of your crop. If you get wiped out, I give you a bunch of my crop. That will improve both our welfare, right? Because getting wiped out is going to zero. You die. That's a terrible outcome. So that will improve our welfare if we insure each other. Now let's say a weather service comes along and provides information and tells you that Farmer A's island is getting wiped out and Farmer B's island is going to be fine. What has happened to welfare? It's gotten worse. Why? Because Farmer A goes to Farmer B and says, turns out I'm going to be wiped out. Farmer B says, well, see ya. I'm just going to keep consuming my high level. Farmer B is somewhat better off. Farmer A is dead. Okay? Total social welfare has fallen because of the concavity, because of diminishing marge utility. More information has made us worse. We say more is better in economics. Once you get topics like this, you realize more is not always better. More is worse. More information has destroyed the insurance market that might function. So in fact, this issue I'm talking about is becoming paramount as we move more and more towards perfect information environment. Okay? So the kind of government policy I'm talking about next become critical as you move towards that environment. But first, I want to make sure people understand the why the private markets failed, why it's a failure. Okay. Now, what can the government do about this? What are some potential government solutions? And we've tried all of these in the US and around the world. So let's talk about three categories of government solutions. The first is subsidization. The government could subsidize the purchase of health insurance. So for example, what if the US government said to all the MIT grads, I am going to give you a $400 tax credit that you can have, if, or $500 tax credit, if you buy health insurance. Well, if there's a $500 tax credit if I buy health insurance, then what's, and I charge $1,500, then what's the effective price down of the healthy guy? 1,000. So he buys, even if he's risk neutral, he buys, as long as he's a tiny bit risk averse. So I do sell to everyone, and I make my money. So one way to solve this problem is to basically pay the health people to get into the market. They can't just give the health money to healthy people. You've got to give it to everyone because you can't tell who's healthy. But if we give everyone a tax credit, then we could bring everyone to the market and solve this problem. Well, in fact, we do this in America. It's actually perhaps the largest hidden government expenditure in our country, which is the tax subsidy 
to employer-sponsored insurance, employer health insurance. The tax subsidy employer health insurance. What do I mean by that? What I mean is the following. When MIT pays me in wages, I am taxed on that, like the taxation we talked about a couple lectures ago. When MIT pays me in health insurance, I am not taxed on that. So what does that mean? So if MIT comes to me and they say, would you like a $1,000 raise or $1,000 of orthodontia benefits for your daughter? And I say, well, $1,000 raise at today's tax rates, I'm going to take home about $550. If you add up all the tax I'll pay, and that'll take home about $550. Okay, $1,000 of orthodontia benefits for my daughter, I get the whole 1000 So why not? So I got these cool braces. They spin and change color. And every two weeks, she's in for different kind of braces. It's great, because it's free. Okay, So we do subsidize health insurance in America. And this amounts to, this program that I just talked about, amounts to almost $300 billion per year. We spend almost $300 billion per year giving a tax break to people to buy health insurance. Okay, so that's one tactic we take to try to solve this problem to get healthy people into the market. That's approach one. A second approach one can use to try to get people into the market is a mandate. Suppose I just pass a law that says everyone has to buy health insurance. Well, then I've solved the problem, right? I know what my expected costs are if everyone has to buy. I know my expected costs are 1400 so I know I can make money at 1500 well, that's easier at one level, and I don't, have to I, don't have to spend, I don't have to spend $300 billion a lot of money. This costs me zero. It's harder at another level. Why? What's the problem with that solution? Yeah? Why not have the money transparency? Well, may, may, not, may not have it. That's right. What else? Yeah? You may not want it. The healthy people are going to be pissed. They're like, look, if I had chosen not to, you're going to basically, the mandate only has an effect if it changes people's behavior. But change the behavior, you mean you're making them do something they didn't want to do beforehand. So the problem with that, the problem with this is you spend a lot of money. The problem with this, you piss off healthy people. OK? Um, the third approach we could do, OK, and there's lots of examples of the mandate. Obviously, we know about the health insurance mandate that was originally part of Obamacare. But that's not the, the biggest example. The biggest example in the US is what's called workers' comp insurance which is insurance that you have for on-the-job injuries. If you get hurt at work, your employer pays money so that you get reimbursed when, you, when you're, uh, it pays your medical bills when you get hurt at work and gives you partial replacement of your wages. That is mandated insurance on all employers in America, except in Texas. Texas, they can choose. Every other state, it's mandated. Mandated insurance, every employer in America, they have to buy workers' comp. So we have examples of that, and that's an $80 billion a year program. That's a big deal. Finally, we could just provide the insurance. That's actually the most common thing we do in America. Social Security is our program that provides insurance for the elderly for their, for their costs for survival after retirement. Medicare is insurance for the elderly that we provide. Unemployment insurance is insurance we provide against losing your job. Disability insurance is insurance we provide against be having a career-ending disability. So this is actually the most common thing. Indeed, provision of social insurance in America costs almost costs um, more than private insurance. So we spend about a, a trillion and a half on private insurance in America. Social insurance is probably about 1.7 to 2 trillion, depending on how you measure it. So actually, this is the biggest thing we do is we just provide insurance. Okay? And that is um, and that's a very large uh, that, that's a very large solution. Now, once again, what's the problem with this? Well, you don't make the the health people unhappy because everyone you just give it to them. The problem is you have to spend money on this. This is 1.7 trillion dollars in taxes we've got to raise every year. That's that's non-trivial. Okay. So basically, each of these solutions has potential problems. So the adverse selection problem will cause the private market to fail. There are potential government solutions, but each have limitations. This one's pretty expensive. This one's super expensive. This one pisses off healthy people. Okay. Now, you'll note the middle one, the piss off healthy people, is kind of subtle. You don't see a lot of healthy people railing against mandated provision of workers' comp, like they did against the health insurance mandate, because people don't know. Okay. So in some sense, this one's a little bit subtle, because okay, people have to know that you're, you know, basically it's sort of crazy 
that I'm paying taxes every year. I'm never going to get hurt at work. Am I going to have, what am I going to like slip at my desk or something? I'm never going to hurt at work. But I pay taxes all the time just in case someone else at MIT gets hurt. You know, some of the janitorial staff has a, fit, has a risk of being hurt. I'm paying taxes in case the janitor gets hurt. I should be upset about that, but I'm not. Uh, and in some sense, it's about kind of what people know and what they don't. OK? So that is the basic argument for social insurance. But when we provide social insurance, despite all these problems, we enter into a fundamental trade-off, which is let's decide we've determined some optimal government policy. Let's decide that the market's failed, so we're going to do one of these things and so, or some kind of issues and solve the problem. The problem is that when you insure people for risks, you create a new problem called moral hazard. Moral hazard. Moral hazard is basically the adverse behavior that is encouraged by insurance. When you insure people, you encourage adverse behavior. So the classic example of this is, if I have health insurance, I ride my bike less carefully. Because if I get in a crash, no, no, I'm not crazy. I still don't get in a crash. But I'm a little bit less careful because I know I'm insured in case I get in a crash. If I have fire insurance, I don't buy a fire extinguisher for my house. Because if it burns down, I'm just going to get the money back anyway. Or if workers have insurance against losing a job that pays them when out of work, they might search less hard for a new job. right? Basically, if I lose my job and I got nothing, I'm going to work my ass off to get a new job. If I lose my job and the government says, well, for 26 weeks, we'll give you half your salary while you look for a job, I'll be a little bit less rushed. Okay? The problem, and there's lots of evidence that moral hazard's a problem. It comes of two types of evidence. The first type of evidence is fun anecdotes. So the greatest, best anecdote of workers' compensation. Let's take that. Workers' compensation, it's a program clues needed. Lots of people get hurt at work. I don't, but lots of people do get hurt at work. And so it's a sensible social insurance program. The problem is it has a huge moral hazard component. And there's fun examples of this, like the, um, the prison guard in Massachusetts who claimed he got hurt on the job, collected $82,000 in benefits while the whole time running a karate school and teaching students karate. And finally, someone noticed online this guy who couldn't work uh, was running a karate school and doing karate kicks and stuff online. So there's all sorts of fun examples about that. But more convincing for economists is statistical evidence. And the statistical evidence is clear that moral hazard's a big problem. For example, if you raise the benefits people get under workers' comp, suddenly they become injured more often and stay out of work longer. And there's no reason. Injuries should be because you got hurt. Okay? So how can it be that suddenly when a state raises its benefits, suddenly there's more injuries? Well, the answer is moral hazard. When states raise their unemployment insurance benefits, more people leave their jobs and they stay unemployed longer. Moral hazard. So the moral hazard problem is real. It's an inherent trade-off. Actually, not just with public insurance, private insurance too. Anytime you insure people against something bad happens, you're providing less of an incentive for them to try themselves to avoid that bad thing happening. OK? So moral hazard is a real problem. And it's essentially the trade-off. On the one hand, we talked about why people like insurance. We talked about why people like private insurance because of risk aversion. We talked about why government intervention insurance markets is necessary. But that comes with a trade-off, which is the more insurance you provide, the less people will take care of themselves. And that's the trade-off. Okay? Now, why do we care? Let's just step back and say, okay, that's like an interesting economics concept, but why do I care? Why do I care if someone stays out of work longer or fakes an injury or whatever? Why do I care about this? Why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem for two reasons. Well, there's two costs to moral hazard. The first cost to moral hazard, the first cost to moral hazard is lower efficiency. And the best way to see this is just to think about the economics of the consumption leisure trade-off. OK? Think about how I make my decision of how hard to work. OK? Basically, if there's no insurance, no social insurance, no workers' comp, no employee insurance, how do I choose how hard to work? How do I choose how hard to work? How do I do that? What's the trade-off I consider in deciding how hard to work? Yeah. 
Consumption versus leisure. Consumption versus leisure in particular, I will mix trade them off until the marginal value of the next hour of leisure, marginal value of leisure, equals the wage. Because the marginal value of leisure is above the wage, I should work less hard. That means I'd rather be at home. If the marginal value of leisure is below the wage, that means I'm just wasting my time at home. I should work harder. So I'll continue to trade off work and leisure till the next hour of leisure makes me just as happy as the next hour of working. Okay? And that is the efficient outcome. That is a socially efficient outcome. Because leisure is not a social bad. There's nothing wrong with leisure. Okay? People value leisure. They should get to trade off the leisure versus what they get from working till they choose the right amount. That's what makes society best off. Now, what happens if I say, well, if you sit at home, you're also going to get a check from the government? Well, now what's my new equation? Well, now if I work, I still get the wage. But what happens if I sit at home? I get the marginal value of leisure plus the government check. So now I sit at home until this equation is true, which means that I sit at home until the marginal value of leisure equals the wage minus the government transfer. That means the marginal value of leisure will be lower than it would be without the government transfer, which means I work what? More hard or less hard? If the marginal value of leisure is forced down, that means I'm doing what? Don't raise your hand. Yeah. More leisure. Than more leisure. leisure. Because remember, there's diminishing marginal values of everything. So that was taking more leisure, less work. So the government is causing me to work less by essentially saying, look, I'm going to reward you more for staying at home. What does that do? That means that people work less than is socially optimal. This is the social optimum. This means people are taking more leisure and working less than is socially optimal. When people work less, that shifts in the supply curve and lower and creates a deadweight loss. Social welfare has fallen. Let's be important. Let's rem let me remind you. It's not fallen because people take some time off. Okay, many people on the conservative side of the spectrum will act as if work is a virtue. Work is not a virtue. Okay? The optimal solution is to work until your value of working equals your value of leisure. If you're someone who has a job that you hate and doesn't pay well and you love watching TV, then you should work less. That's what's optimal for society. But you shouldn't work even less because the government's paying you to stay home. That reduces efficiency. So that's the problem of moral hazard, is it lowers efficiency. There's a second problem, of course, of moral hazard, which is if you work less, then we have to tax people who do work more to pay for these programs. So it raises taxation, it raises the required tax revenues, it raises the tax revenues required. Because if you're sitting at home more, I got to make more money to pay for you to sit at home. And we know taxation also causes deadweight loss. So it's a double whammy. I cause you to sit at home, and I cause other people to have to have more taxes to pay for you to sit at home, which causes them to work less too. Okay, there's a second round effect. As a result, moral hazard causes inefficiency to society. And that is the trade off. Once again, I told you this course is annoying. We don't give you right answers, we just tell you trade offs. The trade-off here is we need programs like unemployment insurance because otherwise, let, let's take the case of unemployment insurance. Let's go through it one more time. Imagine there's no government unemployment insurance. And you said, that's great. I'll offer private unemployment insurance. Well, that's not going to work. Why? Because people know way more than you do about whether they're going to lose their job. If you off tried to offer private insurance, you'd lose your shirt because of adverse selection. So absent government-provided unemployment insurance, there would be no unemployment insurance, and that would be bad. That would mean people would be subject to a risk that would drive their consumption to zero. Remember, most Americans have no savings. That would mean Americans would be subject to a risk where if they lost their job, they would starve. That's a very bad outcome. So it is socially valuable to insure against unemployment risk. The private market can't do it because of adverse selection. Therefore, there is a compelling case for government Unemployment insurance. But when it provides unemployment insurance, it causes people to sit at home extra and not work as hard. And that's, that's the sort of chain of logic which leads you to the trade off. What this says is optimal social insurance that in these markets 
We're going to want some social insurance, but not too much. Okay? We're going to want enough to protect people against starving, but not so much that it causes people to sit at home. So for example, if I told you I'm going to set up an employment insurance program, the way it's going to work is if you lose your job, I'm going to pay your entire wage for as long as you need until you find a new job. That would not be a good idea. Okay? That would cause a huge amount of moral hazard. And remember, compare that, compare that program to one where I'll pay you 50% of your wage so you find a new job. Well, 50% going from 0 to 50 is a 0 of your wage to 50 of your wage is a huge consumption smoothing benefit. You go from starving to being able to eat decently. 50 to 100 is an increase, but not as much. But 50 to 100 has a huge moral hazard effect. So you're going to want something more towards the middle where you're getting people away from starving, but not so much that they don't work. OK? So that's the trade off. So let's talk about that trade off in practice. Let's talk about the US Social Security program. The Social Security program in the US. OK? Social Security is our biggest single social insurance program in the US. It's currently, um, currently the social security program is about $800 billion per year. That's real money. That's even one Jeff Bezos has. Okay? $800 billion a year. Okay, that's more than he's worth, and it's every year. Okay? What does this program do? What this program does in a nutshell is it insures you against the income loss you're going to face when you retire. Okay. When people retire, they suddenly go from having a lot of income to having no income. And basically, the idea of Social Security is to make sure you don't starve when you're old. So the way it works is you pay a tax. And if you ever see a line your pay stuff that says FICA, that's what this is for. You pay a FICA tax. It is 12.4% of payroll, half on you and half on your employer. But it doesn't matter if half's on your employer, right? Because we learned, we learned two lectures ago, it doesn't matter who pays the tax. It's a 12.4% tax. That's what matters on you. Okay? That money then provides that when you retire, starting at age 62, you get a check from the government. And it's, you get a check from the government that lasts until you die. The check from the government you get is what's called an annuity. An annuity is a payment. Annuities are the opposite of life insurance. Life insurance is money that your family gets when you die. Annuity is a, is a regular payment you get until you die. So the way it works, you pay 12.5% of your income all the way through your working life. Then when you turn 62, or you can collect it later, um, you then get a payment for the rest of your life. Okay? That payment um, is typically about half of what you made when you were working. But it's very progressive in the sense that for someone who's very poor, who is very poor, it'll probably be more than half of what they made. For someone who's rich, it'll be much less than half of what they made. It's a progressive payment. Everyone gets it. Everyone did Social Security. But how much you get from it depends on your income. The poorer you are, the more generous it is relatively uh, when you retire. OK? Now the, yeah? Is it possible that um, as life expectancies get larger, it's going to be like harder to, to have Social Security? That's, that, that's a huge problem. It sounds like you should definitely be enrolled in 1441. That's a, the whole half a lecture we spend on that. I don't have time to talk about it here, but clearly a, this is a huge, a huge. So j just to give you a couple numbers to, to keep you up at night, okay, we all know we're all talking about the deficit is 500 billion. It's a big deal. Okay, if you add, ask how much has America promised to pay to our senior citizens over the foreseeable future, minus how much we're collecting taxes, we are currently as a nation $75 trillion in debt. Okay, and it's because of the aging society and things like that. So we got big problems coming down the road. We can talk about that another time. Okay, but let's focus on the program itself at a point in time right now. Okay, so basically, we see here the moral hazard trade-off. On the one hand, we don't want people to starve when they're old. On the other hand, if I pay you once you're retired, that could cause you to retire. If I say once you're retired, you're going to get a check for fifty percent of your wage, you might say. Well, if it's my wage isn't that much, but I really don't like working, I'd rather just hit the links at 50% of my wage. So that's the trade-off. Okay? Now, how do we think about evaluating that trade-off? Well, evaluating that trade-off, different countries think about it differently. In the US, we think about it in a, what I would say is a fairly rational way. 
which is let's consider your decision to retire at 62 versus 63. The way it works in the US, we say, look, if you work one year more, since it's an annuity, you will get one less year of payment. Right? If you start it one year later, you're going to die at the same time. You get one year less. So what we do is we pay you more every month. Indeed, for every year you delay, you get 6.7% more every month, reflecting the trade-off that you're going to get it for a shorter period of time. And that turns out to be roughly fair. Given the expected life of Americans, that's a roughly fair trade-off. Okay, every year delay, you get 6.7% more. In Europe, they don't have this. So every year you delay, you just get less money before you die. So let's take the example of the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, you can retire at 55 with a benefit that is 90% of what you made. So if you earn $30,000, you can retire at 55 with a benefit of $27,000. And if you decide to work instead, you just forgo that $27,000. There's no bump up of your benefits. That's just one less year of $27,000 you get. So what that means, if you're in the Netherlands, your choice is work and get 30, or stay at home and get 27,000. In other words, it's sort of like a 90% tax. Think about it. By working, rather than staying home, I'm only keeping 3,000 of the 30,000 I made. It's basically like a 90% tax. But that's not all. How do they pay for this program? Well, they tax people. Well, you can't tax people who are at home. You got to tax workers. So if you work, you also have to pay a 45% tax to pay for this program and lots of other things. 45% tax, you know, it's a high tax rate for everything. What that means is if you stay at home, you get 27,000. If you go to work, you get 30,000 times 1.55 or about, or about uh, 18,000. That's 1.6, 165. So your choice is stay at home and get 27. Working at 16.5. Guess what? No one works. No one over 55 in the Netherlands works, like zero. OK? Now, they might work on the black market in ways they don't report to the government. But basically, they just sort of sit around coffee shops and spend their retirement money. OK? So here's a case where they've made a very different decision about how to make this trade off, which is, you know, it's a pretty sweet life for the elderly in the Netherlands. OK? But no one's working over age 55. And that's a different way to resolve this trade-off. So basically, this illustrates different design features of the program. What makes the Netherlands program have much more moral hazard than the US is their benefits are higher, and they don't increase your benefits if you work more. So essentially, these are little kind of tweaky details that turn out to matter enormously for how we think about the program. Okay. Now, I hope you find that interesting. That was a lot to put in one lecture. Like I said, if you find this interesting, this is a whole Third of, third of a semester in my class, 1441. So take that. We can learn a lot more about it.